All right, everybody, Coach Lee here. Let's talk all things ultra with the Mid-Atlantic 24-hour that they just had this past weekend down in Washington, North Carolina. Uh, they had a whole bunch of races down there, a 100-miler, a 12-hour uh, great race that was really raced for 12 hours. Uh, it's amazing athletes in that. Uh, but for the mid Atlantic 24 hour solo, the athlete that I currently work with Michael Spadaccia won his event and he was the only athlete to go 400 miles in that 24 hours. Everyone else, um, just, uh, was just short, but he got in about 405 miles. It was his best effort to date. And I wanted to break that down because this really just was not a single race. This was a long-term project that we have with Michael for his eventual assault on Ram. We hope uh, 2025 he'll do the full complete race um, across America in 2025. And this is all part of the project to make him the best athlete that we possibly can to get him to rock out his best ever Ram, which will be his first Ram. So let's jump down and you know break down the data and go through this and just kind of show you how he prepared and built up for this 2024 mid-atlantic uh assault uh it was a great uh, great day i was as a coach i was very happy let's talk about uh, this quote um this is crucial uh ultra is not easy it's hard there are soaring highs and there are debilitating lows with all racers uh, in, in, in the endurance world, but especially with the ultra events where you can have this piercing highs and these debilitating lows. And it's your job as an athlete, uh, working with your coach, working with your community, working with your team, working with your family to make sure that those lows don't go too low, right? The true brilliance of an athlete is not just to climb that mountain once, but to find a way to continue to climb that mountain, then another mountain, then another, right? Uh, I, I don't get too uh, profound that often, but you know that quote really resonated with me. So let's look at this data. Let's jump in here. So this was the course. This was down in uh, Washington, North Carolina on the East Coast. This is about a 25-mile you know, closed circuit. People who rode the course, it was slightly changed from last year, but people really seem to like this course. And this seems to be what the course will be for next year as well. But when we look at this day, this weekend, how did this work? This athlete came to me about two years ago. This was not his first 24 hour event to get to this event. He raced up uh, Sebring in the spring of this year. He raced Calvin's challenge. He did the race across the East and all the time. We're looking at his data. We're looking at ways to improve. Uh, when he did the race across the East, he qualified for Ram. So he, he definitely made the cutoff um he did the work i think it was something like uh, 34 hours he actually completed the 630 miles um but it took him about 50 hours to do that if i remember correctly um but key for me in training ultra athletes is we work with power we work with heart rate we work with rate of perceived exertion we work and really triangulate all those three things key for michael was that he allowed me uh when the first kind of season that we went through to really work on his FTP, his functional threshold power, really to get his FTP as high as possible. And for uh, an ultra uh, endurance athlete, he let me do a two month experiment where we did a lot. We worked four months on a great base, bringing his FTP up to higher than it ever was before. And he came to me from being coached in the past. He came to me from being one heck of an athlete and we we got his FTP higher than it's ever been, but he also let me experiment a little bit. He let me do a two-month period of pretty much 
uh, a solid VO2 block where we really, you know, there's three ways that you can, you know, really work on your FTP. One is pushing it up from underneath with zone two, zone three work. Uh, another way is to extend it out to make sure that you can do zone two longer, zone three longer, uh, your threshold longer, but then we can grab hold of all of it and pull it up. And so in those two months of VO2 work, he really allowed me to experiment to see how high we could bring his FTP up from just grabbing hold of it and bringing it up above. So we did a lot of FTP work. We do a lot of, not a lot of sprint work, but yeah, we do sprint work year around, even for an ultra, you know, endurance athlete, the physiology that you're working with, especially out there on the rate, you know, race across the East, you're not doing any sprints out there, but you really have to dig in a couple of spots on this course. And so we want to make sure that all of his physiology is just buffered up as much as possible. So Michael has really worked with me. Then he hired me as a nutritionist. I'm also a certified nutritionist. And we did a great three month plan where we break down everything that he's doing. We get, try to get the best quality ingredients into his life. We work on his 24 seven, his sleep, uh, his breathing, breath work. We do core work, some light strength training, things like that. We're ha we have all of these in his plan. You know, bodybuilders often say that you know, 70% of their body is built in the kitchen. Well, for me, you know, 85% of an athlete is built in their 24 seven, their time, not on the bike. How much sleep are they getting? How much stress do they have in their life? How are they dealing with that stress? In that three month plan that I have, we cover stress, breathing, uh, meditation, uh, quality food, amounts of food for him as an athlete. We break all this down. So for two years, Michael has just been rocking it out as an athlete, doing everything that he can. Uh, Ram has always been his dream. It's kind of a, a lifelong dream of his to race across America and to get a great uh, qualifying time in that. Um, yeah. And so that's what he's done. And so let's break down some of the data. Once again, you know, Michael got, um, uh, he did, uh, 24 hours. He got 405 miles and we can sort of break down some things here. This is his power. And one of the things that I love about, um, the ultra endurance world is that it ultimately is pacing. It's sort of how slow can you go for the longest? It's about pacing. It's about hitting certain zones. It's about your efficiency and staying in that zone, you know, not jumping from this zone down to this zone to this zone, not jumping all over the place, but just to be in a steady state effort all the way through and in this race. And so this was his best race to date, even though in race across the East, he qualified this data was the best data that he ever gave to me. So this is his power. Look at how steady that power is all the way through the race. And uh, interestingly, of his three 24-hour attempts, and this is only his third 24-hour attempt, not including the race across the East, this was the most time that he was able to stay on the bike. So uh, the Sebring, I think he was on the bike for 17 hours. For Calvin's Challenge, I think he was on the bike for 16 hours. For this race, he was on the bike for 22 and a half hours. So <laughs> amazing. And you can see how little he did. And interesting to me is how to pace your 24 hours. And so there's some strategy involved. And and the strategy largely involves with environmental factors. How are you going to deal with the heat? The heat in race across the East was debilitating for a lot of people. <clears throat> August, North Carolina on the beach. It can be hot. So he benefited. It was a very cloudy 24-hour uh, period. But Michael 
we have all the data and I look at a thing called efficiency factor. Efficiency factor is basically uh, how many, it's a little oversimplification, but how many watts can you do per heartbeat? Uh, me, myself as an athlete uh, in the cool uh, over winter, I can crush it. I can crush it, but I get a little heat up there. It gets up to 80 degrees out there. All of a sudden, uh, I lose a lot of efficiency. I cannot do as many heart uh, watts per heartbeat that I can do in the cool. Michael, that we have from his data, has great EF, meaning that if you're looking at a pacing strategy like for this, for the 24 hours, that you might want to go a little harder until it gets hot. Then you might want to just chill, relax until the heat goes, and then you might want to pick it back up through the night. So you kind of have three distinct blocks. Michael, we didn't need to do that or really even to think about that. We just really wanted him to do a steady state effort throughout this thing. But where do you start at your steady state? How do you know how many watts that you can do pretty much straight across uh, for an entire 24 hour race? And that takes experimentation. That takes time. You That takes, you have to do this event uh, a few times before you really really get your a sense of your legs and what you can do with nutrition, with lack of sleep, with all the debilitating factors associated with riding your bike 24 hours. And as we can see, this is his power line. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't start up here and collapse all the way down here like it does for many people who ride these for the first time. <clears throat> It stays straight across. So he nailed his power. And we can look at his speed. Pretty much keeps his speed constant all the way through. And his cadence, and this is very typical uh, of pretty much any effort that you do. His cadence does drop a little bit, but barely. And so what Michael did with this, and he showed himself that pacing, steady state, not going out too hard, not trying to win this race in the first five hours is the way to do a 24 hour event. It's all about steady state. Um, I love to look at this chart right here. This is called the DFRC chart. Um, and this line basically models how much he's going above his FTP. So if we think of your, um, Physiology in terms of a diesel engine, which is responsible for powering uh, zero watts all the way up to your FTP, including your FTP. And then when you go above your FTP, you're uh, engaging your anaerobic battery. And so when you engage that anaerobic battery, when you go up above FTP, that blue line sinks down. OK, and in a steady state effort like this, we kind of don't want to see that line ever dipping down. But there are reasons to make it dip down. You want to freshen up your legs. You want to get out of the saddle to do an effort to wake up, to get some adrenaline going. Uh, there might be a situation where you have to go around somebody. You know, there are definitely reasons to bring that down. But we want to minimize that line as much as possible until the end. Right. And so here we see Michael barely, barely going above his FTP. All this line represents his FTP. All this represents his power. That's his power data. And then we can see that, you know, he has a couple of efforts, but nothing too substantial until the end. And that's what I say. This is where he drops his bombs. And that's what I love to see in terms of a pacing effort. Go do your pacing effort for those first 20 hours. And then the last four hours, you know, ratchet it up a little bit, right? That's called, you know, um, you know, if, if you're a track runner, you'll understand this term negative splits where <clears throat> you have, you know, four laps around the track and, 
Your first lap might be 61 seconds. Your second lap might be 60 seconds. Your third lap might be 59 seconds. And your last lap is 58 seconds. That is your fastest way to run that race. And that's the same thing I work with on all my ultra endurance athletes. That concept of negative splits. Drop your bombs at the end. When you drop bombs, when you, bu- when you burn matches, you don't get the matches back. But you're creating all of these waste products in the body that you then have to carry through with you for the rest of that effort. So don't build up those waste products until the end. And when you get to the end, it doesn't matter how many waste products you've done because you're done with the race. And so you can just go walk it off, walk off all those waste products. Okay. Now, if we look at this, this is a a good one. This was his Calvin's challenge. In this race, he definitely tried to win the race. This is five hours of effort, and he was slamming it. He was having the time of his life just uh, singing like a little boy on that bike, just rocking it out, having the time of his life. But as you can see, those spikes get smaller and smaller as he dies a thousand deaths. And you can see at the very end where he has this big black hole where he just Uh, that was a forced break. That was a forced timeout where he just basically couldn't go any farther because he built up all these waste products, but he depleted this crucial glycogen that he had in his muscles. And for you as an ultra endurance athlete, you have to spare that glycogen in your muscles as much as possible, right? You have, uh, when you do these events, you're largely working on two physiological, uh, systems for energy, your fats and your, the, the, the sugar in your muscles and the sugar in your blood, if you will, the sugar in your liver. And so, you know, you have 80,000 calories of fat in you, you have about 2,200 of calories built up into your muscles. So you want to spare those muscles as much as possible. You have to eat, you have to replenish that you can replenish that, but there's always diminishing returns. You just can't keep filling the muscles up. They just get, you can keep throwing stuff at it, sugar at it, carbs at it. But ultimately those muscles, if you keep attacking them, if you keep using that precious glycogen, you are going to deplete it and it's, you just goes down, 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 and you just can't throw enough nutrition at it to refill those muscles for this type of effort. And so you can see uh, with this effort, I think he did, he went a lot harder at the beginning, but he got like 330 miles in that terms of that event. So you can see the difference, right? This is what I like to see. Um, for an athlete. That's what I like to see for an endurance athlete. Put all those efforts at the end of your race, spare the glycogen at the beginning of the race as much as possible. Then we can look at his time and zones. So he had roughly uh, almost uh, like 17 hours of zone one. And when I, when we mean zone one, this is really what we mean. So he is really flirting with the very upper edge of his zone one and the bottom of his zone two. And that's what I like about Michael. So we test, we have events, we have the data, we have his zones pretty much dialed in. And that's what I love. And so he had most of his time, a little bit of VO2, a little bit a threshold, a little bit of tempo, a little bit of endurance. But if we look back at his Calvin's challenge, look at that. Look at, you know, like if I were to tell you when you started in ultra endurance athletes that you're going to go faster and farther with that than with this, you would probably call me crazy. But here he was only eight hours in zone one, a lot more in zone two, but a lot more in tempo threshold, a lot more at VO2 and a lot of more at max efforts, right? And these are pretty much flat courses. The one in Washington was a little bit flatter than the one up in Ohio, the Calvin's challenge, but this beats this in endurance athletes, right? Let's start. This is the last chart that I want to show. This is his cardiovascular drift. So this is his heart rate for the entire time. This line represents his power. His power sort of declines a little bit through the night. Nothing troubling, no red flags whatsoever. But look, 
there's essentially no cardiovascular drift. I think for this uh, effort, he had about a 7% difference uh, between his heart rate when it started and uh, by the time it finished. But in the Calvin's Challenge, he had a massive cardiovascular drift, which was uh, 30%. Now, what is cardiovascular drift? Say, you know, you're going out on it, you know, it's just an easy ride. And it's really hot out, but all of a sudden your heart rate is at threshold. So you're doing a zone two effort. Your heart rate is zone four. That's decoupling and it's massive cardiovascular drift. So for this effort, he had his absolute best data in terms of cardiovascular fitness, meaning that his wadded strategy was correct. He started off like I made, I make suggestions as a coach and it's up to the athlete to follow those suggestions. He really dialed in and nailed that, that those first five hours, those first 10 hours, which helped his cardiovascular system support him throughout the entire race. So instead of working against him, it's working with him for that entire race. Right. And then the final shot, this was the overall female winner. Here he is, Michael Spadaccia. Yeah, he has two medals on. One, the overall winner of the 24-hour period, and one for over 400 miles. So congratulations on a fantastic workout, a fantastic event for uh, Michael in this event. And he is next going after Psycho. Uh, and then he's going to do an event in the spring. And then it's all about Ram 2025. But this event for me as a coach, like this was, I, I wouldn't care if he came in 30th on this. That data that he gave me was just like as about as perfect as you're going to get for one of these ultra endurance events. And then that he won was just icing on the cake. So he gets it. He got it on his third try. Uh, we've experimented and we've practiced different little scenarios, but this was Michael at his finest. And it was great to see the him uh, on that top step because if you've ever got to meet Michael and I hope you guys reach out to him if you see him at the races he is such a lovely dude right and he's a great person to talk to and he's really the type of athlete that you want to see on that top step so congratulations Michael again coach Lee I'm a certified nutritionist and I'm a licensed cycling coach I work with uh, everybody uh, from TT 5k TT on this week. I had a guy win the state of Maryland, senior Maryland 5k TT championship. So this is a great week for me, two top steps. Um, but I work across all disciplines, mountain bike, uh, triathlon. Um, I'm full time at this. So that's very important as well. Experience the full time coaching um, experience, if you will. Um, yeah. So, Hey, reach out www.sandstead.com. If you're interested in ultra, if you're interested in dialing in your TT, if you're interested in dialing some other form of racing, please reach out. I would love to talk to you.